close this page and I'm going to start a whole new section. Um, not another principle, but a whole new section. So what we're going to do is we're going to start doubling up every week. So I'm going to do principles of Bible study, and then we'll jump right into Bible study methods. So now we'll actually get a piece and a part and an opportunity to take some of these and put them to work. So it'll be awesome. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks for your word. So powerful, so changing. It's, it's changed us so much, and we're just super grateful for it. And Lord, tonight, move in us. May these things inspire us to love your word more. God, I know I need to love it more. We need to learn it more. We we'll promise you, God, when we get this, we're going to live it. So out of this room of people, God, I pray that you would produce leaders and, and pastors and missionaries, just out of us, common people, God, that you would choose and you can do incredible things through us. But Lord, I know it's going to start here with this learning session, with this this loving. And so I pray tonight that motivate us, move us. Amen. Man, guys, I hope you know that, that uh, these Bible study principles, there's people in our church that know these, they just never use them. The leadership class, our, our hopes would be out of here would become leaders. That there would be men and even women that would, you would lead you when this church needs some leading done. You would you know, step up and do it. Or this class is you told me in Maine. I think I knew the list of people that went through this class and it's meant nothing. Went through the Bible Institute. So let's just get after it. You know. This number nine is the principle of spiritual discernment or comparing scripture with scripture. Um, so the Bible is of no private interpretation. So let's go to Second Peter one twenty and have a reading. As soon as somebody gets there, go ahead and read. Second Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Right, verse twenty one. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy. The holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Right, so it's very clear. Second Peter 1, 1, 20 and 21. Is that camera recording? Yes. Okay. Um, next, is, God has the only interpretation that matters. His opinion is the one that counts. So when you read verses in the Bible, people are going to say to you all the time, well, that's just your interpretation of that. Here's what we got to be confident of. This is God's interpretation. Not mine. And, and we're going to get that. I'll show you how here in a second. But interpretations belong only to God. And we're going to learn this. Write down Genesis chapter 40. In verse 8. Go, go ahead and also write down the verse 41, verse 16. Oh no, Second Peter 1, 21, clearly. Go oh, here. Right. So, uh, my bad. I, I thought I messed up. I thought yeah, it was me. That's me. I'm okay. following, right? Okay, well, I'm, I'm following to that point. Okay. Yeah, and then that next blank down there will be Genesis 40, verse 8. Right. And uh, this is where Joseph, remember the dreams? And they were just like, they thought, man, dude, you're a smart dude. But is somebody in Genesis 40? As you get Genesis 48, and Jason go to Genesis 41, 16. We get there, Heather, just read. 48 says, And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me then, I pray you. Interpretations belong to God. Good. 41, 16 says, And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer with peace. Right. Interpretations belong only, only to God. 
And here's a good example below that, colorblindness. So people that are colorblind, um, Bo's colorblind. So he gets certain colors mixed up. So he can still, um, he'll say to me sometimes, he'll say, is that, color, is that color green? And I'll say, it's, it's blue. And normally he's not super grassy. There's certain ones he gets mixed up on. The bottom line is colorblindness. I don't care if Bo does see things. The reality is it's blue. But he might just say, I, I swear it's green. I believe him. He's just wrong. You know, it's so. When, it's like people not understanding a piece of the Bible. If they don't have the Spirit of God inside, and they just say, I'm sorry, I just don't see it. Just say, true. This whole thing is exactly like, for, for a lost man, it's like me and you getting a telescope and looking up at the moon. You ever even through binoculars look at the moon? You can see the holes in it and everything. It's pretty cool. And then you hand the binoculars to a blind man and just say, check the moon out. And he just says, I, I, I don't see the moon. And this is where I start. I, I and this is where you got to say, I agree with you. But there is a moon there. And I've struggled with this. Okay, so you try to get somebody that's lost to understand something. Yeah. Well, they're, maybe they're not going to understand it because they're lost. Satan blinds the minds of them. So how do you not. get them to understand it? Prayer. That, I mean, that's the only way. I mean, God's got to do that. You just have to walk away. Here, here. We're like paper boys. We throw the paper. Here it is. And hope they open it. Right. And then hope they read it. But God's got to interpret for them. Yeah, that's why salvation's not of us. We proclaim the gospel. But he's got to open. And sometimes through that process, he'll open their eyes and they'll be like, I see. Because there's been many times I've had, I've had discussions and almost to the point where it's an argument. Like, all right, well, I, I don't have anything else left to say to you. That's it. I don't know what else to say. And you're exactly right. You, you can't. If somebody don't believe the Bible's true, just say you're going to go for on a debate, and you start using the Bible. And if they're intelligent people that are not Christians, they'll just say, "Can't use the Scripture. We, we don't believe it to be true." And they're right. You're like, okay. So that's why when I deal with hard issues like counseling issues, sometimes I won't use the Bible for dealing with lost people. You know, I deal with other things and pray God open the speech. And then I'll keep pointing back to the Lord and I'll hopefully, you know, their eyes will be open. It, you know, it's weird. It takes both. I mean, it takes somebody to be willing to make a choice, but then God will open their eyes. So that, That's a hairy line. I want to be careful of that line because um, on one side you're a Calvinist. You know, I don't ever want to fall there. You know, because some people believe basically, we believe you're blind from birth, God's got to open. Calvinists would basically believe that maybe your destiny, your salvation is already kind of sealed. You know what I mean? So it's a hairy point, like repentance. Well, so if you repent to come to Christ, that means you got to turn around and change. So you got to change first to come to Christ, or is Christ the power that causes the repentance? And you can really see a little bit of both in the Bible. Like, so you just got to make sure we reason that out. But yeah. You're right. So I sometimes with some guys, so what do you do when that happens? I, I think you let them, th that's when, I, I think you speak the gospel and you live with the gospel. When they don't believe the words, they don't hear it, then you live the gospel. Your behavior and the things you do. I got a guy, Pop, once at work. He was a jerk. Nobody liked him. I got him, I got myself a Pop. I thought the people wants to put some coins in there. Got him up to the back and he goes, his name is Kevin. He goes, you know I wouldn't get you one. I said, it don't matter. I got you one. But it, little things like that eventually open up the door of opportunity where, you know, you're a really nice guy. And that's when you can say, well, technically I'm not. But let me tell you what made me a nice guy. I got saved. And I wanted to be, you know, so... Look at the next line there. It's vital that we reread. It's vital that we read out of the biblical text exactly what it says, mm -hmm. not reading into what was our own preconceived ideas and opinions. And this is why, gang, when I we even talk some of these principles here, I have I know Christians that will take verses over in First John 
and they'll prove things, and they'll twist things. You know, like where it says, well, if you don't love your brother, then the love of God's not in you. And they'll try to prove weird things like with verses like that. Well, I know the Bible. I know when that book was written. I put it in context. I know how the New Testament lays out. And I don't try to force that into my world. Because I know that book was not directly written to me. It's not a Pauline epistle. Because I can find where Paul tells us to forgive one another. Why is he telling you to forgive one another? Oh, because I hate dude's guts. If I'm going to just solely base it off of 1 John, if I went to bed mad at this guy and I never woke up, I'd burn in hell. I know that based upon what Paul says, that verse does not apply to me. So what Christians do is try to twist it and make it work with the book. Don't ever twist it. We just compare scripture with scripture. And it's simple. Either we can lose our salvation or that verse is not written to the church. There's our two options. So what do I do? I get in the Bible and just like that, I compare scripture with scripture. So God never, we'll see here in a few seconds. It would be all interpretation comes from comparing scripture with scripture. This principle is found in 1 Corinthians 2. 2, verses 1 through 14. Now let's go ahead and turn over there, and we won't read the whole thing, but we will go to certain spots. He says, you know, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit and power. And again, that's what we want. That, that's what I want for my life. Enticing words of man's wisdom. Education. Um, it was George W. Bush that went to this event for the church. And it was a big church. So they had all these fancy speakers and politicians and polished people. And he said at the end of the night, he said something about the most powerful guy that spoke tonight is that truck driver. This truck driver, the church had a simple truck driver get up and just stand up and just say, I'm going to tell everybody how I make the world. Uneducated. So it was the gospel that was so powerful. And I just thought that was neat, all these educated guys speaking, and it was like, that dude is incredible. So the next line in your paper is, Paul explains the great contrast between man's wisdom and God's wisdom in the first eight verses. That's why it says in verse 4, my speech, my preaching was not enticing words of man. It was a demonstration of the spirit of God. <coughs> that your faith should not stand the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It's the worst feeling in the world I've done it before. I've stood up at the Bible before and preached a message without God's power. It's the whole principle of Samson getting up to fight. Remember when he finally got his hair cut off and he got up to fight? As at other times, it says he whiffs not that the Lord had departed from him. It had nothing to do with his hair. It had to do with the Nazarite vow. He struck out on all three of them, disobeyed God, and God finally pulled off of him. So he started, uh, and I know a preacher that did this, my preacher in Kansas City, Bob Alexander, greatest preacher I've ever heard in my life. And as the years went on, he started preaching in his flesh. And he started preaching Proverbs, uh, you know, the false bounds of abomination every week he preached. And he stayed on that verse, and then he branched off of it every week. He did it for a year. And everybody was just like, what's wrong? This is getting weird. This is. I was out in the hallway once, and another preacher was preaching, and he was preaching the word hard, and it was good. And I was out in the hallway. I forget what I was doing. But the church was packed. I walked, and I seen Bob in the hallway talking to the guy. Bob goes, I'm off to turn up my game, ain't I? He's out there really getting it. And it was just like, like, it was weird. But I, it just reminds me of kind of a, a guy that's not doing it in the power of God anymore. And so we'd rather be needy, you know, and need God's wisdom and, and not just... Um, you know, preaching our own business. The next line there is truth, even deep things, is revealed to those who possess the spirit. It's revealed. These are things we know. You guys remember the prophet Elijah around the top of the mountain was, you know, uh, no, they were in the valley. That's what it was. And the enemy was coming. Remember his servant, Elijah's servant, going, oh my gosh, we're going to die. And Elijah goes, God opened it. And all of a sudden, his eyes are open. He's seen on about all the angelic host. Remember that story? Mm -hmm. that, that's it. I think as preachers and ministers, that's what we say. 
May she see it today. May he see it. May they see it today, you know. We want to preach in God's power. But it says in 1 Corinthians 2 and 10. So we want to read 10, verse 10. For God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Yes, so that's how we get it. The next line says, comparing spiritual with spiritual is how the Holy Spirit, that's your blank, Holy Spirit gives us correct understanding. This is why we don't get intimidated by smart people. We've got the wisdom of God. And so what's, what we do, though, is don't be intimidated by smart people. So when a smart guy says, well, you know, you know how it, it, the human body, and he begins to explain something, and here's where you humble yourself and say, no, I don't know. Like speaking in front of the football team. You don't stand up there and I don't stand up there and act like I was a great football player. Well, I was when I was a kid. I can't lie to them. So I just humble myself in that area, in that department. And I just give them why. That's all, because that's right now all I'm really kind of capable of doing. The punter now that has me shag balls. I just humble myself and shag balls. Also, when we get to the sideline. Can I ask you a question? And it happens all the time. I get so sure. And then the questions come. And so I just got your word. Open their eyes. You know, give them the vision. Had two guys tonight tell me, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in church. We had a baby. And you know, this Sunday you got another one. I'm telling you, Pastor, I'm coming to church. Two guys told me that tonight. And they've been here, but just once. One guy just, I seen him. I said, hey, dude. I said, uh, you came to church a few weeks ago. He just, I'm sorry, man. This week. I said, no, no, no. I just want to know how you did. He goes, man, I love you because I'm coming back. But see, I want to be like, remember in the, the movie Navy, not Navy Seals, I got mixed up. The movie with uh, with uh, Steven Seagal, he's in the ship and he's the cook. Under Siege. Under siege. The, first one. the first, remember that one? Oh my gosh, it's a great movie. Because you know what happens? He's a like special forces, he's max. But he's kind of taking a job in his labor. He's just cooking on a ship. When things go haywire on it, he starts just destroying people. And like at several points, of they're like, um, who is this guy? And he's just like, I like that. Water boy. <laughs> so uh, the Holy Spirit, um, there's some verses, First John 2 or First Corinthians 2, 13. So anyway, verse 13. Those things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Yeah, spiritual with spiritual. <coughs> and he teaches them verses in John 14 and six and, and chapter 16. I just put those verses in there for us. Here's what we're, what, you can look them up later. But you know them already. Remember the verse where it says, the Holy, he teaches us in truth. Well, the truth is the Bible. That's, it's the Holy Ghost. He teaches through the Bible. That's why there's not much difference in being filled with the Holy Spirit than being filled with God's Word. There's not a whole lot of difference there. Because you'll see, even even says in Ephesians, there's two spots that says that in the New Testament. He even says in Ephesians about being tanked up on the Word. And then he'll say, even like teaching and monitoring, he says those things in the same context as being filled. And you start getting it that, wow, you can't be filled up with the Spirit without not knowing God's Word. It, it takes that. So, but he'll give us understanding. People want to pray also for the guidance of God. I want to pray for your guidance. I want to pray for your guidance on which job to take. When people, when they, what they really mean by that is, Holy Spirit, please give me understanding. Well, look in your word. As you read the Bible, let God reveal it through his word. For most people, it becomes a feeling. They just want the right feeling. I just know it, man. This is it. Not always. Um, but if you're in the Word, man, it's amazing the little things that God gives out of His Word and it makes clear to you. You'll be reading a lot of stuff about family, 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 and you'll start realizing, oh, this job I'm going to take something to be with my family, and that's all I've been reading about. Yeah, God's saying, family, tell the job to go take a hike. Or, you know, it could be the opposite. You know, it depends. Just get in the Word. That's how He's going to really reveal Himself. 
to us. It's through his book. Now, he does use people, too, but he uses people because he uses everything in the Word to us. It's his Word. The Holy Spirit guides and directs. But pe if people ain't in the Word, just praying pray for God's will, want the just praying for the Spirit to guide me, well, show me the word, show it to me. Show me how he's guiding me in his, in his book, because that's how he does it. That's how he gives us understanding. Um, the next line is, the Bible is impossible to be understood by natural human reason alone. Natural human reason alone. Proverbs 3, 5, 6 there, what's it say? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not with thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, he shall direct thy path. It clearly states, lean not into your own understanding. Lean not. Just stay in the book. Don't try to reason this out. But here's the simplicity of it. If you're lined up with God's word, your relationship is just straight with him. We're all in the book. You're walking in the spirit. Your prayer life's good. So if you're in God's will, and then you're confronted with decisions, and you're like, oh, I'm still not sure what's going to do. You know what? That's God's plan. Give each other one you want. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 does not trust in the Lord's all our heart, but not know and understand. All they ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy what? People usually quote this. He shall direct thy path. Folks, it won't say that. There's an S on that word. So a lot of times I think people come to this fork in the road and they're right here and they're like, oh my gosh, which way do I go? Which way do I go? And now sometimes I think it's best. I think, you know, I pray, still seek his face and it's a decision making time. I, I've sought counsel. I've talked to my wife. We've read the word. I'm just like, man, I still don't know. Which one do you want to do? I kind of like this job better. I kind of like this better, this house, or this area. You know? To me, it's almost like opening a bag of lollipops. Put down a bunch of Tootsie Rolls and just be like, oh, I prefer the red one. So I just take it. I think some, but you got to be in God's will first. Once you know that, I think this becomes simple. People overthink God's will. What they need to do is really get in the Word. Make sure you're walking. Is there fruit in your life? See, God confirms foundational truth in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And they have to be Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> and let's check out these passages down here at the bottom. Um, let's have different people. Who wants 2 Corinthians 13.1? Almost there. I'll take that. Okay, then somebody give me John 20, 11, or 12. Okay. Shane, you want to take Matthew 18, 16? Mm -hmm. I'll take John 8, 17. Okay. Taylor? Okay. Um, boy, that John 5 is a big one. I can do it. Okay, I think we'll only just read the first couple of verses and we'll get the point we need. Okay. And then, uh, Taylor and I, you got to find the book Isaiah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was like, oh, good okay, John. I don't know where I said that. <laughs> It's big enough that you flip, you'll get to it. Okay, guys, everybody, let's listen and, and kind of think. That way you know what to write here. I'm not going to write these in the board because they're a little bit long. So let me give you 2 Corinthians 13. 1. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So write that in your blank beside that verse. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Or something along those lines. Hey, it's true in a court of law, too, isn't it? You know, if me and Taylor go to court over an issue, I guarantee if I have no witnesses, well, I mean, he, he works for the city. He's a cop. Well, but no, it should. It should, but now if I have another witness saying, and here's what he did. He slammed me on the ground, or he was rough. With, you know, that, that, that becomes different if there's witnesses there. Now cell phones are witnesses. I kind of like that today. That people can see that. And people can talk and say, I, yeah, you've been right. I slammed on the ground. But that's all I did. You know, but it needs two or three witnesses, and every word 
will be established. John 20, 11 and 12. And 20, 11 and 12. And Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and see if two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. So Mary's at the sepulcher, Jesus ain't there. Guess how that was established? There was two angels there. Two angels spoke at that tomb. Matthew 18, 16. But if you will not hear these, then take with you one of one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. This is church discipline. If you go to a dude on an issue and he ain't getting it or don't want to get it, if it's a real sin issue and you're really by, you can't get over it, take take two, take one or two witnesses with you. Every word will be established then. And by the way, to do this biblical. For instance, if I had an issue, if Taylor had an issue with me, one of his witnesses probably shouldn't be his wife. That's what the Bible says, grab an uncomely member. So it'd be best to find somebody that wasn't even involved in our situation. It'd be awesome to grab just a godly lady out here and say, I hate to put you in this uncomfortable spot, but well, we kind of need some help. And me and him both love God enough and know this lady or this dude's godly enough, so we'll take it. But I'll tell you what everybody does. Everybody has an issue, they take it to the pastor. I think I, I think that's bad news. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's kind of like the Moses situation. Hard issues can be taken to a pastor. But if we got disciple people and there people been through D2, people been through the Bible Institute, why does that have to go to a pastor? The Bible says an uncomely member would be the best. Because just say you're a younger believer, and just say Taylor and them are giving 200 bucks a week to the church. And I kind of know that. And you, you don't even give yet. You're learning. You're still growing. I'm bent. This guy's been coming to the church longer. I've known him. I know they're, you know. That, that's where you grab an uncomely member, which means they, they have no skin in the game. And they can sit down and just say, well, I'll be biblical here, to be honest with you. And uh, I was at a meeting one time, and I got a little upset. And uh, I hit the table. Hit the table, and uh, there's a guy in this church, and, uh, and he's a good dude. And, uh, and I, I yelled, I yelled at him, and it was Sean. Sean calls him on the carpet right to me, and he goes, "Hey, Mike, I totally agreed with you, but I'm watching your behavior now, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm just like maybe the flesh. Well, I backed up my point with the Bible. I said, do not I'm angry, but it's biblical anger.' And I took my Bible to kind of prove that point. And I said, you guys never see me slam the table. I said, but this, this is, I feel this strongly about it. And I, I you know, but it was nice because there's witnesses in the room. Sean was willing to call me on the carpet. you got to have guys in ministry. The biggest, I'm, I'm getting off course here a little bit, but the biggest, one of the biggest problems I see in churches are when leaders get untouchable. They have nobody they're accountable to. Nobody can tell them what to do. They're the boss, and they didn't ask the pastor. And you might catch me on the wrong day, where I'm not walking with the Lord. I'm in my flesh. You know, I, I have those days because I'm a human being. I, I shouldn't have frequently, and I shouldn't punch holes in the wall, all that type of stuff. But hopefully I got the character, but I don't know. I, I think we all just need accountability. And I think this is another. Two or three, if I take the church on a wild, it's kind of like moving down to this building. Logically, it wasn't a good move. Think about it. Nice. We finally got out of that metal building up there on the highway, which is now the gun shack, the tax shack. We moved that church. It didn't make sense. Now we're going south. Why would you go south? Build churches on the highway where people can come and, you know, marketing principles and all that. Well, it's different at the church. And so, I don't know. What, what, you know what amazes the people? I've told the pastors this. You know how many people we lost moving here? No, we had a hundred percent retention. Every, and the big pastor always they would ask that, "Hey, um, how many did you retain?" A hundred percent. I had two families that disagreed with moving here. They both talked to me about it and said, "We'll go 
go with it. We trust that you're talking with people and leaders. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm not making this move by myself. And uh, I don't even sign checks. Even though I can, I'm on the signature card, but I don't anymore. And there's, you know, five people that can sign on our church account, and they can speak for the church, and uh, I'm just one of them. And on that, it's supposed to always take two. So anyway, one of those couples has left that disagreed with the move here, and they didn't leave because of this move. And one couple's still here. And they're actually getting more involved than I've seen them get involved in a long time. I'm, I'm tickled. So, anyways, uh, John 8, 17 says, um, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. So just put down the testimony of two men is true. Now guys, our point here is to prove that we compare scripture with scripture. That's the point. So don't run with this principle and just say, well, if the two men are liars. Or, yeah, we're not talking about two men being liars, or thieves, or fleshly men, or women, you know. We're talking about scripture, and God sets up this principle on purpose for accountability. That's what it is. So, Heather, read the first couple of verses of John 5. Okay. If I bear witness of myself, myself is not true. There is another that bear witness of me, and I know that the witness which is, I know the witness witness which he witnesses of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and he and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Okay, but that, did you just read a couple verses? 35 to 35. Oh, yeah, yeah, then you're done. Uh, oh, okay. We don't have to read all of it to get what okay. he said there. He basically said, there's another that bears witness. Well, he was speaking to John the Baptist there, bearing witness of the truth. So, and then ultimately we know the Holy Spirit, but anyways, the whole point is that, what, two or three witnesses? That's why it's super important on the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 says, oh, he was seen of the apostles, and he was seen of five hundred people. But Isaiah twenty eight ten. This one? Yeah. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. God wants you to learn that word, bro. I know. <laughs> Here a little and there a little. Yeah, so basically just like yeah. Isaiah says precept on precept. Line upon line. So this is the proof of, yeah, line upon line. So we, we already know this, but doctrinally, um, we don't base doctrine off of one verse. When somebody shows me in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit coming down and filling the whole place, the reason why I can call that is I can just say, can you show me other verses in the Pauline epistles like where the Spirit's coming down and, well, they can't find it. So when I see an event like that, it's important, it's true, but it's a one-time event in history. So I, I compare, so when somebody says, well, I think being filled with the Spirit is, and they'll say, because over here in Acts, Paul laid his hands on them and they were filled with the Spirit. One verse. So you've got to find other verses in Acts that talk about being filled with the Spirit. And I'll say, well, look over here. Paul didn't put his hands on them. But they were still filled with the Spirit. See, what I'm doing is comparing Scripture with Scripture. I won't deny that Paul did lay his hands on them and they were filled with the Spirit. But if I compare Scripture with Scripture and then go to the Pauline epistles, I see that, oh, that's not a consistency in the Bible. So people, people base doctrines on one verse. And that's where I think, I think it keeps us safe. And people, remember, don't doubt in the dark what God shows you in the light. Don't doubt in the dark. So somebody will find one obscure passage and go, see, you can lose your salvation. They've always been a Hebrew 6. And they show that, and I'm like, boy, it does. But what's weird about it is why does all these other verses that Paul wrote say you can't? So if you're not a Bible believer, this is where the world will say, see, the Bible contradicts itself. And we say, Oh, no, it doesn't. It's dispensation. What you got to do is follow the dispensation and say, God's doing a new thing here. Or, you know, the simple.
simple one. It's like, no, you know, my, my grandma and David said, God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. My grandma was afraid the Holy Spirit was going to be taken from me. I hadn't resurrected yet. She goes, yeah, but this verse is in the Bible. Uh, grandma, Jesus, they were under the law. Jesus hadn't resurrected yet. I don't know what you're doing with that verse. And she was afraid. Playing on her emotions. Other churches teaching you your salvation. Granny, you got one verse there. How about I give you six that will contradict that and you can go to sleep tonight? That's how we got to do it. Scripture is scripture. So, this is the principle of spiritual discernment. We compare, now notice this spiritual discernment is not just, oh God, open my eyes, let me see this. Some people are going to go, I still don't see it. And as you start comparing scripture, people will literally go, I got it. What happened there? The Spirit opened their eyes because we compared spiritual with spiritual or scripture with scripture. So that's where the best commentary on the Bible is. It's the Bible. All that. That's why we have concordance. That's why we look at it. It's, it's the words. We believe we compare all this stuff. So when I see a phrase, I'm just like, hmm. And then all of a sudden, God shows that phrase somewhere else. I'm like, oh, I just got another witness. So I'll start comparing and figuring it out. I'm like, oh, there's a thread there to copy. Any questions on this one? Okay, guys, what I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to, I'm, I'm going to give you a divider right now. Because I'm going to start giving you papers that don't really, they're not really about, um, they're not really about uh, Bible study principles. We, we used to teach you in a separate class. And we decided to kind of, I used to teach methods of Bible study. I called it unlocking the Bible. The problem was it became very similar. It became very similar to uh, expository preaching. So we're going to try to do something just a little bit different and just see how it works out. So. Put that right in behind there in your notebook, and it'll all it'll all iron out. Very end of this, just grab two of those and just slip them in behind me. When I was in Belize, I paid a guy off the street. He said he was an artist. He seen I was a white guy and he says, Hey man, I pay you you pay me some money if I give to draw you a portrait of you. I said, I ain't doing that. Me and Sean Sean were together. He goes, seriously, man, just a dollar, just a dollar. And uh, I said, Alright, do it. I don't know why this is. I took this notebook down there, but he did that. Like, it's like Michael Jordan down there. That was, that's Sean Sean. Yeah. Me and Sean. You're kind of like Mr. T. Uh, you uh, kind scary of Mr. Chinese. T. A Chinese. Mr. Yeah, I'm a little bit. <laughs> I like Chinese food. But anyways, uh, he got done with that. And I ended up giving five. I said, you did a great job. You know, I mean, it's not perfect. But what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to copy that and darken it and then frame it and give it to Sean. <laughs> I forgot I had. I opened up like, holy night. <laughs> okay, so guys, we're going to get an opportunity to start using these Bible study principles we're learning. Um, but I used to call this class Unlocking the Bible, but it's, it's technically, it's just Bible study methods. There's different methods of studying the Bible. And uh, I just want to teach them to you because um, when you're reading your Bible in the morning... You know, some people want to get involved with study. Well, who has time? Not everybody has time. I think we should study the Bible. So, well, there's a different method of studying the Bible in the morning than you'll want to study like teaching a book of the Bible. So let's just learn these methods. And then, uh, let me look how many I have to teach. Some of them are free. Yeah, there's a devotional method, a chapter summary method, a character quality method, a book background method, chapter analysis method, a biographical method, a word study method, thematic method. Topical method and a book synthesis method. There's different methods of study. So, the first one, we'll start with the easiest. But okay, we got, um, I'm going to take, I'm going to go five minutes fast because we started later. Let's take ten minutes together. Um, 
um, unlocking the Bible. The two reasons why we should know the Scripture. Here's your Bible Scripture. What are the two reasons we should know the Scripture? You know? Anybody? Have you ever looked at Second Timothy? Highly divide. We show ourselves approved. Well, that is true. We should do that. Look at 2 Timothy 3. Look at verse 14. Paul says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 16. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So two things it mentions here. In verse 15 it says, From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are what? Able to make thee wise for what? Uh, unto salvation. So the first reason we should know the scriptures is that we might come to know Jesus. Two. It says in verse 17, That the man of God may be perfect. That word perfect means mature. That the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So the first blank there, number two, or I guess it's your second blank, um, to help us grow spiritually, we might be equipped for God's word. Word. Do you guys see that? That the man of God may be mature, then thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I love that word furnished. You know what that means? You're a Christian, you want to minister to people. So you bring them into your living room and have no furniture. They sit down. Make yourself at home. That'd be super hospitable if it was snowing outside of rain. When the sun shines, they come in. But as you learn the Bible, you're more equipped to deal with people. You just say, hey man, sit down on the couch or you can sit over in this chair, that's fine. You want something to drink? They got places to go, you got TV, and all that stuff. What is that? It's furnishings. So this the Bible will help us grow spiritually that you can you can minister to people. So look at B, two basic reasons for uh, doctrinal error. Doctrinal errors, Matthew twenty two twenty nine. Somebody read that. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Two things. There's two reasons for error in the Bible. One, people don't know their Bibles. He says, you don't know the scriptures. Well, people don't know the power of God. So if somebody intellectually knows the Bible, but they're not saved, I wouldn't be intimidated by that at all. You know, they need the power. That's what, that's what they need. Most people don't even know the Bible, but once you know the Bible, man, you, you better have the power of God. That's the two reasons people in doctrine are really, really messed up. Every once in a while you meet a Pentecostal that knows his Bible. He's got verses and scripture he can quote it. Or you'll meet somebody at work that like, hey, this dude really knows the Bible, but his wife is a freaking train wreck. Why? He knows the power of God. The Bible's not effective. He knows it intellectually, quotes some scripture, got some things. I think one of those two things, Jesus says. So see, why Christians do not study their Bibles? One, I think this could be ignorance. They don't know how, right? We are exhorted to study the Bible. We are encouraged. And then the second bullet point there is we need instructed to study the Bible. I like that Chinese proverb. Somebody read that one. That's a good one for everybody. You may have finished and repeat them for a day. You should maybe finish and repeat them for a lifetime. That's just true. So our church is known for teaching rebels. People will leave our church. Guys, I am not lying to you. At one time, Emmanuel Baptist Church on Sunny Lane by my house, their youth leader 
was a couple that was led to Christ and discipled this church. Their song leader was a lady that was, I think she was this disciple. I think she might have been saved. Then they had a college ministry going. And this dude was saved and discipled by the church. All of their main workers at Emmanuel Baptist Church was taught the word. Now, Harvest Bible Chapel. Their board, if you looked at their elder board, they're from here. Their youth leaders, their junior high leaders, and their high school leader, both either led to Christ or discipled in this church, and they were taught the word. Went through D2. It's crazy. Now, there was a little Facebook deal where one of them was just up preaching. I just thought that I guess they didn't fight that. Ain't that something? It don't mean them churches are bad. It just means we, we want to exhort and instruct people how to do it. That's why when they go into another church, they're immediately an asset. Now, we'd never do that because we'd get to know somebody first. It'd take a while before we put anybody in a position like that. So I don't like the way they do that. But, you know, and for what, whatever reason, I could give a personal opinion about it. It don't matter. But I'll tell you what, right now, two of the people that I'm kind of thinking of in my head right now, um, they were at Emmanuel. And they left and went there. So people can say what they want, they can think what they want, but I know the truth. Oh, this is the same church for them. And that won't be the last. Still be perfect. Just a matter of time. That's why there's something to be said for somebody steadfast and just stay still. A man that can stand. I don't move easy. Now, I'll move when God tells me to move. But as a man, I'll stand. It's tough right now. Things ain't very good. Let's just stand. Be, be patient here. Be calm. Watch what God's doing. We're, we're not quick to move, you know. And usually, if you'll weather the storm, most people usually say, glad we didn't bail. It's worth it. It's worth sitting still. Then you won't have that reputation. Maybe it must be pretty cheap. Um, two. Under C, why Christians don't say their Bible? They're not motivated. Many have not experienced the joy that comes from personally discovering truths from the Word of God. Experienced. What was that? That's Chinese. Oh. <laughs> I can't spell it. <laughs> yeah. Um, guys, it tickles me, man. Twice this has happened to me. Um, God taught me something years ago out of one passage of Scripture. It's a big deal. It's Gad. He has seven sons. And each of the sons' names meant something. So I put together this message. And here's the fruit of what an overcomer looks like. And uh, when I laid it out, it's a real smart pastor. Um, you know Jeff Cox. Jeff Cox went to this camp and he comes in and he goes, he does tell some Well, it's like one of the only things out of the Bible that somebody hadn't taught me. I, in personal study, can, I mean, there's little tidbits God will always give you, but a lot of the stuff I teach, I'm like, I got this for somebody else. It's so good, I'm going to just pass it on. But this was something fresh. And uh, then I had a guy call me in Ohio and say, hey, we got a church camp coming up. He goes, I heard of bits and pieces this thing you did on being like an overcomer. Like as a Christian, how to live victorious. You use the guy in the Old Testament. He had sons. And twice. And it, but, just, but I'll tell you, it's this here. When you experience the joy of just saying, man, God, God showed me that. And I'll remember it. I could do it right now. I could really come up with it and preach right now. And So you, you get that kind of joy you want to get after. Why don't people study the Bible? Who wants to study? Everybody always thinks, what's study? Homework? Who likes homework? Every once in a while you'll find a weirdo out there that likes that stuff. Becky likes it. She's, she likes that stuff. I, I did never have. But the Bible's different. It's an eternal book. It comes to life. You're like, holy light. So not giving people answers, not teaching. If you're in a position, so why, why study? Nobody's coming to you for answers. Three reasons why Christians don't study the Bibles. They don't know how, or they're not motivated, which would probably lead to the same amount of they are. <laughs> so, 
it takes effort and concentration and persistence. That's what those changes prove and studies show that they will prove. Yes, Mr. Christine? Um, most great truths of the Bible um, do not lie on the surface. You must dig. Look at Howard Hendricks. He's a guy from, he died just a couple years ago. He's a Dallas Digital Theological Seminary guy. He said, three stages of your attitudes towards the Bible. So castor oil, which that's an old-fashioned medicine that grandma used to use. Um, it's good for you, but it's not enjoyable. Cereal, Bible study is dry and uninteresting. But you know it, and there is no issue. Or it's peaches and cream. And you really tease me. It's just it's delicious. So there's three attitudes. Stages. I like how you said that. So I'm put that in there. That's because there's sometimes I study the Bible. I'm just trying to describe. I'm like, it's good. I know it is. It's good for me. I got to keep pushing through. So let's we'll pick up here next week with uh, principle number ten of Bible study, and we'll jump in on principles of dynamic Bible study. Then we'll get off into our first method of study, how we can break the Bible 